Hello and welcome to Love Data Week. Our regional keynote address today will be given by Paul Sorensen. The title of the talk is Data as an Organizing Tool, How Sharing Information Can Keep Us Accountable to Community and Coordinate Across Boundaries. Paul is joining us today. He is the co-director of UMSL's Community Innovation and Action Center, and he leads the collaborative St. Louis Regional Data Alliance to support local governments, nonprofits, funders, and universities in using data for community benefit. The RDA is actively involved in building public health data infrastructure to address COVID-19 and beyond, and works closely with United Way 211 and its partners on establishing the St. Louis Community Information Exchange to share referrals across health and social services providers. Paul previously founded and ran GoodMap, an online tool for nonprofits to organize information about the services they provide to their communities, and he served as the Director of Strategic Planning at Grace Hill Settlement House. Paul graduated from the Brown School of Social Work here at Washington University in St. Louis in 2012 and is slowly pursuing a PhD in political science from UMSL. He was named one of the St. Louis Business Journal's 30 Under 30 in 2014 and was a Focus St. Louis Impact Fellow as part of its 2016 inaugural cohort focused on racial equity. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to Paul. Although, thank you, Bill. Oh, perfect. Um, real quickly, although, thank you, uh, uh, Bill, for the introduction. Um, like he said, my name is Paul Sorensen. Uh, I serve as the co-director of UMSL's Community Innovation and Action Center, uh, long-standing community-focused research center um, at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Uh, we used to be the Public Policy Research Center. Uh, perhaps a couple of you are also familiar with that name. Um, and for the last five years, one of the things that I've been focused most on um, is a project called the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance. Um, our mission at the RDA is to build shared data infrastructure and support strong data actors who use quality data to improve people's lives. Uh, um, so, so really three components of that, shared data infrastructure, strong data actors, um, and then what we use that data for with each other. Um, uh, to improve people's lives. Um, and we have around 380 members. Um, they're across the St. Louis region, uh, local non nonprofits, universities, governments, um, technologists, all coming together to try to figure out how do we construct uh, a meaningful data ecology locally. And so this is a great opportunity for us to reflect on why we came into existence, uh, what the components of our mission mean, um, and where we go from here. Um, I just want to point out that this year um, is a, a meaningful time for us because um, we're we're hitting our fifth birthday. Um, we are founded just about five years ago, um, uh, and partially through a, a grant with Missouri Foundation for Health that we're always very thankful for, um, and spent some time with folks like Bill uh, building a steering committee, trying to figure out where are we going to go from here. Um, and so it's it's exciting to hit five years, um, and also think about what's next. What are the next five years going to look like? Um, and really like going back to 2018 and a couple of the years before that, really explore like what, what led to the creation of the Regional Data Alliance and are we still fulfilling our mission? So I'm going to go back very sort of specific time machine, sort of this period, 2014, 2018, right, um, to talk about the, the events that sort of led to the creation of something like the Regional Data Alliance. Um, uh, this scene should be familiar to a lot of folks, right, the, the Ferguson uprising, the, the rise of the Black Lives Matter mu movement um, after the murder of Michael Brown, and so all of us trying to figure out, right, like, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we organize? And what information do we have uh, to point us in, in a meaningful direction? Um, and of course, you know, between 2014 and 2018, I think there was also a sense of like, oh, there are some national political changes too. Uh, we're going to have to figure this out for ourselves locally. Um, where do we go from here and how do the dots connect? And so there were a number of folks coming to the table sort of asking this, this question of what role should data play um, in the landscape of 
community change, systems change, sort of however you like to frame it. Um, one of the things that we've always sort of held is so Forward Through Ferguson, uh, the organization that came out of the, the response to the Ferguson uprising, um, sort of ground their definition of racial equity uh, in data. I mean, they, they talk about how, you know, equity is when outcomes can no longer be predicted by race. Um, but when you're talking about like, outcomes and prediction, uh, there are some heavy data components sort of involved um, to understand what that looks like. Um, I, I really enter the conversation on a, an aspect of how do we organize community resources most effectively, um, whether they're, you know, food services, education services, whatever they are in the community, uh, alongside folks like United Way 211, uh, alongside folks like uh, the Clark Fox Family Foundation. Um, uh, you know, at the time, uh, as Bill mentioned, I ran a small uh, social enterprise called GoodMap trying to figure this out. Um, and we were really trying to, you know, like, how do these things link together? You know, how do other past efforts at one STL, like other previous planning initiatives come into play? Um, and I think that like, <laughs> what the landscape looked like. This is actually one of the, the big data tools people pointed to at the time, uh, an ecosystem map, a child well-being ecosystem map that the Clark Fox Family Foundation put out um, uh, to try to figure out like how the dots could connect. Uh, and so for me, for me personally, right, like uh, I had spent from around 2011 to 2016 uh, at a nonprofit in North St. Louis called Grace Hill Settlement House, um, seeing where these data spaces didn't come together um, and how that did impact people on the ground, right? Like I would run rental or utility assistance programs um, where we had money to provide to, to help meet people's basic needs. And they would say, hey, I'm also looking for a job. Can you help me out? And I, I couldn't find any good information around it, right? Like, or we were writing grants and trying to define like where exactly would we deploy resources like this part of the neighborhood that part of the neighborhood right like how are the housing impacts showing up um and it was just really hard to know um and so came to the table with another organization um and all these folks clark fox forward through ferguson uh the promise zone the st louis mental health board ready by 21 we're all trying to say okay we know we need data um, uh, to impact community change, but it's it's pretty disconnected. Um, how does it come together? Where should it come together? And where do we go from here? And so that sort of led to the creation of the Regional Data Alliance. Um, we had some data challenges. Uh, we did not have a, a sort of overarching data intermediary, what we would call a data intermediary in the region. Um, and so one of the first things we did is we asked folks, you know, out of town, sort of like, what are other cities doing? Um, and so the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is a, an initiative out of the Urban Institute, um, has been a great partner throughout this process. And um, we sort of said, hey, here's the challenge we have. <laughs> we have some infrastructure challenges. Um, as you all know, St. Louis is, is a particularly fragmented region. There are little pockets of data here and there. They weren't coming together. Um, and so they said, look, there's a, an effort out of Pittsburgh dealing with fragmented governance, uh, governments, the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center. You should, you should see what they're doing. On the other hand, we said we also have a lot of data people. Um, who are coming together saying, look, we're doing stuff for our organizations, uh, we think in the right direction, um, but they're not connecting to each other. Uh, we don't know each other. There's not really like a space for us to come together. Uh, and NIP said, yeah, you should talk to um, San Antonio um, and the Alamo Regional Data Alliance, uh, a collaborative that they were, they were running at the time, really also seems like a good model for us. Um, of course, ARDA, the Alamo Regional Data Alliance, were like, oh, we're going to be the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance, but we'll 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 change the second part of that name. Eh, five years later, here we are. So um, Gall got together spring 2018. You know, this major grant from Missouri Foundation for Health with like 22 different partners signing on. Um, that happened as, as I came to UMSL um, as a part of the sort of transition from the PPRC to the Community Innovation and Action Center. Uh, and so now sort of are in a, a space thinking about where we go from here. Um, the picture you see right now is from one of our first uh, big in-person meetings trying to define what our steering committee was and where we were going. Uh, and we were off to the races. Um, so I, I'm going to circle back to, to a lot of what um, I, I think we, we've done over the last five years. 
that we're particularly proud of and we think that 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 you know there's some things to build upon um but because for some reason you gave me an hour uh just to talk um and because we're in this reflective mood of sort of like where have we been and where are we going um i wanted to use this as an opportunity to return to the why behind our work you see this line of, of, you know, to improve people's lives as stated in our mission. Like, it's not just about organizing data and data people, um, but it has an end, right? Like, to improve people's lives. It's not just, you know, to make more efficient business decisions or to, like, help power our own organizations in X, Y, and Z, but it has a broader community mission, right? Like, and we talk all the time about not wanting, you know, this is not about data for data's sake, but okay, like, how do we avoid that, right? Like, I think a lot of folks at this call, and I'm certainly included in that, um, are, are data nerds. We like the numbers. We like to sort of see, you know, the different um, uh, results or implications of, of some of the, the, the data that we manage. But, but if this is for something deeper, Right. Um, if, as we've articulated in some of our core values, that we want to pursue racial equity and community well-being, we need to get specific about what that looks like and how the different elements of our work add up to something more. And so as a launching off point, um, you know, always, always wanting to not, you know, just sort of build upon our own echo chamber. Um, I wanted to bring in, and this is a little bit adapted um, from a, a book that was published last year called The Tech That Comes Next. Uh, Afua Bruce, one of the co-authors, um, spoke at the recent Data Science for Social Impact Summit, uh, and it was great to, to get to know um, her a little bit more. Um, but I thought that that their like why here was particularly well articulated, um, although I adapted a little bit of it um, to focus on data as opposed to technology, although, as you know, those things are closely aligned. So one of the things that they assert that I think is, is really key here is that data, as well as the technology used to manage it, um, is a fundamentally human thing um, with all the possibilities and blind spots that we bring to the table, right? Like this is not created in a lab with no bias, you know, or no uh, influence in terms of um, what we wanna see happen in the world. And it's important to recognize like, this is a thing that we create and recreate and re reinforce um, and not something that's sort of like an untouchable, unbiased component part, right? And because of this, right, it's up to us to work together, work collaboratively um, on building tools that support equity and community and building technology and data tools that support equity and community um, and don't undermine them, right? Like, and I think there are all sorts of examples um, that we can see in the technology space in particular, uh, sometimes in the data space, and we'll talk about us a few of them today, um, where these tools have been used to harm community, uh, whether or not they were intended to. Um, and that's something that we can and need to avoid. Um, and so to do so, right, it's not, again, something that can be done in a room <laughs> with a spreadsheet, uh, but it has to be done with community, right? And so we can grow this notion of equity. Uh, we can learn together as long as we are centering uh, community values. And I would say community values as the community has articulated, not community, not just community centered values that we can kind of create on paper ourselves. Um, and community defined priorities. So like what, where, where should we go? Um, and so, so that I think is a, is a good grounding for like, okay, so, so how do we get there? Um, how do we get there in St. Louis? Um, how can we get there, you know, beyond St. Louis? Although I really do think focusing in on a place um, is, is a really meaningful way um, to understand how, how data and social change interact with each other. Uh, and so I wanted to talk for a little bit. I'm, I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to zoom out again. Um, and we're gonna, then we're going to zoom back in um, uh, to talk right about some of the fundamental thinking behind what we do. Um, behind other data sharing efforts um, to try to get to like, what, what do we need, right? In order to build data um, and supporting tools um, that support equity and community and, and not undermine them. Okay, so we're gonna do a fun thing. We're gonna go to a, a definition of data because sometimes I think we, we talk about it um, uh, we were like, okay, but what, what do we actually mean when we talk about data? Um, 
this definition is, is sort of cobbled together or pieced together uh, through a few, um, but I think hopefully you agree, uh, it nails down a number of things that we wanna see and we wanna learn um, about data and it, its role in our community. Um, so here, here's our sh best shot at a definition of data. Um, data are component parts of information that can be reorganized and processed in order to produce analysis, facilitate action, and guide decision making. Um, again, this is this is our definition of data, um, one that that was sort of put together through a number of, of additional definitions. Um, just you know, to know it does not specifically focus on community and community decision making. Um, it's you know, data in itself doesn't have an end in mind. We have to apply it. Um, but I do think that these are these are the things um, that are important to consider uh, when we talk about data. So let's just unpack it a little bit more, right? So like component parts of information, right? What we mean by that is that data rarely stands alone, but must be combined with other data within the context of a question or issue or component of inquiry in order to be meaningful. Right. So um, one, you know, like little column on a spreadsheet or, or field, right, like by itself um, doesn't tell us a lot. What we're trying to do is combine it with other data to understand how it changes over time. Um, and really, the, it, it's brought to the forefront with a question, um, you know, like how well is this program producing outcomes? Where do we need to focus our time and activity uh, in order to tackle hunger? Um, and so component parts of information, you know, these are things that must be combined and must be within a, a certain context, right? And so the reorganized and processed, um, this is something that's, I think, relatively unique about data for better or worse, right? Like it can travel, it can shift, uh, it can respond in order to, to, to make sure that different needs, different technology tools, right? Databases, models, applications, et cetera. Um, these are the things that they are, are fed into in order to produce meaning. Um, and I think something, you know, as opposed to other components of knowledge or analysis that I think is, is unique about data um, uh, and also, you know, sort of limits its its power in itself, um, but also in, enhances its ability um, to draw connections. Uh, when we talk about producing analysis, um, I know we're, we're at a Wash U space, we're in an academic space, um, uh, it's oftentimes what we do, right? Um, what do we want to know? Is this working? Is this not working? Can we discern any statistically significant trends, et cetera? Um, that, that analysis happens all the time, but it, it also happens in community contexts when people are trying to understand, you know, where are our clients coming from? What are the other social needs that they're experiencing? Um, and really sort of help helping us understand um, a context in a community. Facilitate action, I think, is also really key. Um, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about like administrative data and data exchange. Um, you know, in the healthcare space is sort of like how does information get into or out of EHR systems? How do we utilize you know health information exchange? Um, and so I think that like facilitating action, I think, is both what we do based on the analysis we have, as well as like data as something where it's like here is a record of a person that we want to provide services to. Um, and those are our data sets that can be um, shared or otherwise oriented to facilitate action. And, and finally, guiding decision-making, which if I were to place a sort of like priority pick um, of the thing that I think is most important in this entire equation, it's decision-making, it's governance, it's power, right? So it's like the intersection of analysis and action, um, uh, trying to figure out like, if we do this, this will happen and how do we track and change that over time? Um, I think it's really key throughout, right? Like what analysis is produced, um, that's a decision, uh, right? You know, what actions do we take? Also a decision. But but I also think that like in general, even things that are not, you know, data oriented uh, components of analysis and action, um, the decision making, data can inform decision making uh, across the board. And so that's the full definition. I also think that like in summary, right, like we'll, we'll, we'll try to distill this a little bit more. If data are adaptable pieces of information used for knowing, doing, and deciding, um, what, what does that mean and where do we go from here, right? Um, 
And, and again, I, I think that like to complicate it a bit off the bat, you know, the decision making components, I think, you know, flow throughout what we're trying to do, um, including in terms of like what questions are worth diving into, right? What studies are funded? Um, what will journals publish, right? Like, what are people willing to spend money on in terms of a, an evaluation of a community program? Um, what data are required for billing purposes, right? Going to the doing bucket, right? Like, for financial targets and decisions that are fundably, fundamentally attached to models of care. So I, I, stopping here and sort of saying like, there's a lot contained <laughs> just when we try to pin down at like, what is data and what is it used for that I think are really important um, for us to understand what does it mean uh, locally? What does it mean within the context of, um, communities, right? Um, and those of us who are trying to do community-based work um, to use data effectively and to use data equitably. Um, so I also want to say, right, like we've been thinking and reading um, uh, and you're getting a little bit of sense of like the nerdy ways that I spend my free time um, uh, to dive into like where these questions have shown up in the past. Um, and they aren't new questions, right? In economics and philosophy and public administration, um, and really, I think in some ways, like what is data used for um, are, are questions that are carried forward and been carried forward for, for around 100 years, right? In early modernity and trying to figure out these questions around like how we know and what we know. So epistemology, as well as management, like public management, like where do we use information to drive efficiency or other practices? Um, and so, and I'm, I'm like monitoring the, the sort of participant count because I want to see uh, if, I, if I lose folks in this next part. Um, I, I wanted to take a little bit of a detour um, to talk about uh, one of the most influential pieces in, in terms of how people think about information and information sharing um, to, to really try to articulate, right, like why we think <laughs> managing data in a community-oriented context um, is essential not only for equity, um, but also essential for us to like actually unpack what we know and what we can know about what's going on around us in society. So I'm going to take you back to September 1945. Um, this is a piece, a really critical piece, I, I think, um, named as one of the top 10 or top 20 um, pieces in economics um, that centers on the use of knowledge in society, um, written by, by Frederick Hayek. Um, I'm not going to go a ton into Hayek right now. I think it's important to know he's he's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, this is cited as a major piece in economics. Um, uh, he does have a particular political bent we can talk about in a second. Um, but I think this piece is is really instructive um, to try to drill into like what are we doing when we're trying to manage information uh, and what is the best way to orient this over time. So. Hayek's piece, and it's a short piece um, uh, if folks are, are interested in diving in, really is centered around and concerned with this problem of planning, right, which he essentially defines as a how to secure the best use of resources known to the members of society, right? And so this is just, you know, 1945, right, you know, World War II is, is ending, and there's also the rise of the Soviet Union. I think there was a lot of concern around this tendency towards central planning um, within that sort of society, as well as totalitarian societies, right? All sorts of places that sort of said, science can tell us how society should be run. <laughs> and we can do that by consolidating information within one body, right? Like, one government, one corporation, you know, one person, right, who is really now tasked with, um, with making decisions on behalf of everybody. And so what Hayek points out is that one of our central challenges here is how to combine that information. Um, if knowledge, right, is not given to anyone in totality, right, like, how do you plan? Like, where do we go from here? Like different people have different knowledge in different contexts. 
Um, and what does that mean about our ability to do central planning well? Um, Hayek, as an economist, was sort of pushing against, you know, the tendency of folks to do this uh, within economics and within the United States, um, saying, hey, we can plan, like how industries should allocate resources. Um, but it has implications sort of beyond just the economic space and uh, focusing on it here. And so this is, I think, the, for me at least, the sort of key paragraph. Right. Um, and one of the the really essential points that Hayek makes is that, you know, the the centralization of knowledge um, and of data. And this is kind of funny because he like always puts data or datum in quotes because it's like I guess something that was just really being discussed uh, at the time in 1945. Sort of saying like we can think that if we have all the available information at our fingertips, there are like general rules about society or the economy. Um, that will allow us to better organize what this looks like um, across where we're at. Um, but but here's what it can't account for. Um, it can't account for the knowledge of particular circumstances of time and place, right? And how people's lives play out in practice, right? Knowledge of people, of local conditions, of special circumstances. Um, I think it's kind of funny because because what Hayek is really talking about is what we would maybe call now lived experience. Um, how people's lives show up to them in a particular community um, based on, on where they live, their history, their context, and their condition. And so I wanted to, to fast forward a little bit um, to a piece that, that I think really points out why it's essential to understand um, the, the components of particular places uh, and contexts and why they're so important uh, in what we know and what we do. Um, so, so this is a 2019 play, uh, piece uh, published by researchers, I believe, at Johns Hopkins um, uh, that I, I, I love. It's a little bit uh, of a deeper dive into, you know, statistical analysis. The other thing is more, you know, political and economic philosophy um, that dive into the challenges of using results from multi-site evaluations to inform local policy decisions. Um, and again, not to go too deeply into it, you can, you can easily find this and I recommend it because um, I think it has really fascinating implications. Um, the, the authors did, the, you know, they got, they got a hold of all the data from a number of really robust national studies um, around things like the impact of Head Start. And so, you know, in that study in particular, they looked at um, how Head Start was doing, whether it had the right impact on kids and just, you know, context, Head Start is a federally funded program uh, for three to five year olds. It's essentially free preschool um, in low income communities. Um, and they looked at uh, a couple of things. So they said, OK, there are multiple sites in multiple cities across the country. There are statistically significant findings uh, around how something like Head Start was making an impact across the country. Um, so this is what we want to do. We want to take those findings. Uh, we want to, you know, take out a city, right? Um, and then based on the analysis of Head Start as a whole, um, and using all of the variables, like all of the characteristics of that site, you know, race, poverty, um, you know, the other things that could be could be quantified and fed into the model. Uh, and then what we're going to try to do is predict based on um, the national study and based on the characteristics of the study that are the city um, that we want to understand, um, whether or not, right, like we can predict the impact of something like Head Start on a St. Louis or on a Pittsburgh. And so I, I think the implications of this are, are, are fascinating and somewhat problematic, right, within um, uh, how we typically view data within the social sciences. Um, they found, and the quote that I pulled here, is that the if, if you were to do this, if you were to take all the data, remove a city, and then try to predict uh, whether or not um, using all of the other data available, um, a program was effective or not, um, they found that that being able to predict a positive impact was slightly better than 50%. Basically saying that if I was a, a lawmaker in St. Louis and I was trying to look at a study of whether or not we should expand Head Start services, and I found this like great robust multi-site national study about Head Start's effectiveness, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would work in St. Louis. 
I think that that is so interesting, right? That that local context and and the things about a local context that can't be easily quantified um, mattered quite a bit in terms of how we understood the impact of a particular intervention. Um, and I think that like really underscores like national studies that are looking at national efficacy can tell us what's going on on average. Um, but as we know, it really matters to kids in St. Louis um, whether or not uh, a program is effective here, right? So, so going back to the Hayek piece, right? Like, can we centralize information? You know, like how do we do large scale planning across society? Um, how do we incorporate um, uh, these differences in, in lived experience and local context and these circumstances in of time and place? Um, these are critical things for us knowing where we are and where we need to go. Now, the problem with the Hayek piece um, is that the conclusion he draws about how to best uh, organize this information, I think is super problematic. Um, Hayek's solution is that the way that you organize information that is scattered across many individuals in many different communities uh, is by organizing the economy through the price mechanism. Um, this is where I'll back up a little bit, right? Like Hayek is one of like the, and probably the best, right? Philosopher of sort of modern capitalism. Um, and he really, I think this piece shows, I think the power, right? Like there, there's a lot that is, I, I feel like sort of like a fatal uh, diagnosis of what works poorly <laughs> in central planning. Um, but, but I also think that, right, like, how we align knowledge for decision making in society, sort of saying like, oh, look, like people don't need to know what's behind a the price. Uh, they know what the price is. They like modify their economic activity accordingly. Like this is really the best way to leverage full information about time and place into the structure of society. Um, but I think it's it's worth diving into, right? Like what's wrong with that solution? Um, and what's wrong with it like beyond the price mechanism? This is not gonna be uh, uh, from here on out, uh, a conversation about economic theory um, because really what I think it points out, right? Is like what what's wrong with it? And I do think that there are some things that prices like you gotta commodify everything, you gotta measure it in a financially oriented way. And, and that does have some, some issues in and of itself. But beyond prices, I think the instinct here to boil complex social phenomenon into a single reductive number that masks its social impact and over-focuses activity toward the management of that number it is really the thing that we want to be careful about here, right? Uh, and, and it is something that does show up in our space, um, uh, in the, the spaces of folks who are wanting to do community-level data work. Uh, in a way that I think echoes, right? Like how uh, Hayek recommends and other folks have recommended organizing economic activity around individual actions and one quantifiable number. And so I wanna give a few examples of what I mean uh, about what this looks like in particular. So th this is a top graph and it's like better government association of the US census uh, that talks about units of government per 10,000 people. Uh, this should be a, a familiar conversation in the St. Louis region, uh, particularly those of you who followed Better Together a few years ago and this this like concept of like too many governments. Um, I, I think that like there's an assumption here, right? That like Illinois has too many units of government per 10,000 people, whereas, you know, Florida's ratio is, is a little bit healthier, right? Um, but, but why? <laughs> like, why is that the case? I think that the quantification of like units of government per 10,000 people tells us very little, if not like nothing, um, about the quality of services, uh, the responsiveness of what they're trying to do, right? Like does government work better um, in New York versus Illinois, right? Like I have no idea just based on like counting and comparing units of government per 10,000 people, right? So reductive single number, um, I think drawing some implications about like where we should go um, that I think are problematic, right? Uh, in similar ways that folks sometimes view things like prices. Um, and then healthcare, right? Like the healthcare example at the bottom, 
spend a little bit more time talking about healthcare in a few minutes. Um, I think this is also illuminating, right? Like there's sticker shock, I think, right? Like how much the top 1% of people spend on healthcare. But I think that like the implications of what we do about that require so much more information. Like, why is it the case? that, you know, people top 1% are spending more on healthcare. Like in some ways that could be exactly what we wanted. Fewer people are sick. <laughs> so, so fewer people consume more resources because uh, we're really trying to focus on, on making sure that they're, um, they're taken care of, right? Um, and, and I think it's like, what are people spending money on? Like what's considered waste or not? And I'm not trying to argue that there's no waste in healthcare. I think that's, that's also a big conversation we could dive into. But I think that these questions are the real ones. How necessary is it? Like if the funding were to shift, where to? Because there's a way that you could take this that could say, look, we want to decrease healthcare spending by increasing where we spend money in community health interventions. Awesome, right? There's also a place you could take this that say, we need to ration healthcare. Um, and we know that, that in that environment, folks who are poorer, browner, older, um, they're the ones who are going to suffer. And that's exactly what we're seeing now as we see cuts to, to COVID funding uh, across the country. So wanted to sort of underscore, right? Like there are ways in which this shows up in our space beyond the price mechanism that I, I think over time we've become particularly concerned about. And I, I think this is a good example of a number I, it, it's hard to argue with, right? Like lowering child poverty and the percentage of child poverty. Like obviously this is a thing that we can do. But I think to just focus on the increase or decrease of that number misses all of the important context, financial circumstances of the family, economic system of the community, a history of racism, structural disadvantage, right, that leads to a divide between the city and county or a divide between urban areas and rural areas that we need to account for if we're going to decrease that number. And I think that, that that is really where, right, like in these local data spaces, we want to start getting deeper into in terms of uh, figuring out um, alternatives. Um, just as sort of like a direct counterpoint to someone like Hayek. So this is from James C. Scott. Um, he's probably best known for a, a book in 98 called A Scene Like a State. Um, also like Hayek, push against notions of central planning and sort of like people really trying to, to impose top-down systems in terms of organizing social um, conditions. Um, and, you know, one thing I, I think I Googled this and like it may be misattributed to Einstein, but it's still a good quote. Um, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. Um, I think sort of saying like, what what are the values that undergird this? What are the contexts? How do these things relate over time are just as important? Uh, and one of the things that I think is, is particularly salient to me um, is that if we over rely on that sort of easily measured or easily quantified number, what happens, right? Like it, it sort of takes it out of these questions that we all get to engage in, in, in a vigorous democratic debate about like, where should we go and what's causing this and what should we do about it? And how should resources be deployed? And it sort of says, you know, like the experts got it covered. This is neutral. Like we're just looking at the numbers. Um, and I, I don't think that's led to a lot of fantastic uh, outcomes in society, just sort of looking around um, communities like St. Louis or otherwise. And so um, this essay is great. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, one thing I think it, it is particularly um, uh, sort of impactful for me is he focuses on cost benefit analysis. Uh, which is something I'm sure folks have encountered in your work. I certainly have in, in social services and at the university. Um, but what does a cost benefit analysis require you to do? Well, it requires you to put a cost to everything. <laughs> so you're putting a cost to like the loss of, you know, and he uses an environmental example, a species of a fist, the loss of a beautiful view of clean air, right? Of the future use of a space. And all of those things need to be quantified in dollar terms in order to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, and what does that lose, 
right? Um, uh, in terms of how we understand and value society and, and sort of points out that in the US, even though we have this understanding of ourselves as like individualists, um, these things, this over quantification um, really imposes like a lot of structures on us that make it hard for us to like we're normalized, we're monitored. Like these are things that, that are organized um, around us that we have to respond to um, as opposed to information that we can use together um, to pursue to a better community. Okay, so what's the alternative? So regional data alliance thinking, you know, taking a step back, thinking about where we are, where we want to go, right? And, and really thinking of these sorts of components as the core challenges that we face in the local data landscape. And if we care about doing this work well, community well-being, pursuing racial and social, social equity, right? If we want to avoid this reductive slide into quantitative management, like where do we go from here? Um, and underscoring where Hayek is right, you know, it's difficult for a government, a researcher, a nonprofit organization to have all the necessary information they need to effectively man like allocate resources um, to a given challenge or problem. So if, if we can't use sort of a reductive number like prices, if we want to incorporate local conditions and lived experience, uh, and we recognize how much that matters to how we prioritize this work, where do we go? What's the alternative? Um, one super interesting alternative, and um, I'm going a little longer than I anticipated, so I'm just gonna kind of slide by this is, um, cybernetics, Stafford Beer. Um, I, I think this is just super, if someone wants to go down this rabbit hole, I think it's super interesting. Um, in the 1970s, Stafford Beer, uh, who was a management theorist, um, uh, helped organize things uh, called cybernetics. Um, he was one of the founders of that, um, that field, that movement, uh, was brought to newly socialist Chile to try to figure out how to design sort of a data and technology system um, to distribute like how information like was coming from different factories about like, hey, we're running out of this material. And then like a centralized place would get a ping, right? So it wasn't planning. It was sort of like, how do we design a responsive system? Um, and there was also like, they had uh, these like dials or sensors of like community happiness that they wanted people within Chile to use to say like, hey, this is working or this isn't working. This is like big technocratic experiment of like, how can you decentralize uh, a system of organization that I think tried to get beyond what someone like Hayek was mentioning, trying to figure out how to organize things um, in a more public way. Um, it, it's kind of sci-fi, like this picture is from a New Yorker article that talks about how like no paper was allowed in the control room and like Stafford Beer himself, like it, Designing Freedom is like a lecture series on Canadian radio that is like, just will take it back right to like this like oh this was a different moment than we're in today and i think there's a lot to learn from like okay can you like design a technologically oriented system that like brings data together in a variety of different ways and yada yada it's really interesting um and i i'm i'm like interested just from like a huh that's bizarre standpoint um uh in diving into it a little bit more i'm afraid though that you know that sort of approach typically looks more like this. Um, in the American political and social context, right? Like when we try to in institute deeper technological management systems to impact, uh, you know, sort of like social challenges, what we're oftentimes, you know, led to is uh, uh, what Virginia Eubanks in this, this great 2018 book um, called Automating Inequality, um, underscores as the sort of digital poorhouse. Um, and, and sort of this uh, this diagram um, uh, really sort of goes goes toward like one of these examples where in Indiana, they paid like over a billion dollars to IBM um, to help them automate uh, benefits qualification. And there were a lot of really deep and really problematic challenges uh, with how that algorithm was constructed. Um, and a lot of people were kicked off of their benefits um, wrongfully, um, leading to people dying, right? Um, I, I think the selling point of an IBM is like, oh, we can use data and we can use technology uh, to manage how we um, provide public benefits in a more effective and cost-efficient way. 
But what happened because they the, essentially what they did is they removed humans from the equation. Um, you know, they fired the caseworkers that were working with folks to sort of say, oh, yeah, that is an exception or, oh, let, you actually need this document. Um, and replaced it with technology systems uh, without that human component uh, really led to a lot of uh, destructive consequences. So I, I think that like one alternative, right, whether it's the maybe, maybe, I don't know, this is it, it ended before it really got off the ground in, in Chile, the Stafford Beer example, or what I think is much more common, the sort of automating inequality, like this just sort of recreates the problem in a less accountable, less human way. I do think it's worth pushing for what else is out there, what else is possible, how do we organize information in a more meaningful way. So uh, again, to underscore, right, like the biggest mistake made, right, in Indiana, um, uh, and I think in these spaces as a whole, is replacing human judgment, replacing democratic process, right, with these sort of like technocratic, non-responsive systems um, for planning and resource allocation. But I don't think it's necessarily the case, right, um, for data to be used in a way that skips people, um, that reduces their conditions and what we need, um, and, and how we need to intervene. And so I think it's worth, again, like returning to this definition of data and diving into those human components and where they come together. So when we talk about adaptable pieces of information, right? Like what, what, what pieces of information, like which data, who creates it, who manages it? What does it represent? Who gets to make that interpretation, right? Like how does it align to deeper data sources? Um, that matters a lot, right? Like. It implicates people. It implicates people coming together to create meaning, to determine shared action. Um, even if we're just talking about like what information is important to us in the first place. I think it also like when we talk about what data are for, like what do we use them for? Knowing, doing, deciding. These also go beyond the numbers. Like what questions are worth answering or asking? Uh, what structures or incentivizes action in these spaces? And who has the power to set and change the direction um, of the questions we know and of the things that we're trying to do. Um, and so how do we like orient these questions? Like these are deep questions about knowledge, about systems, about power, and where do we go from here? Okay, so um, not lose a lot of you, this is great. Um, so I, I wanna be clear that this is not the language or framing that we used for the creation of the St. Louis <laughs> Regional Data Alliance. Uh, in the formation of our work. And you can also see um, my sort of like latent political scientists like kind of growing into the space and like these things are bouncing together hopefully in meaningful ways. But if I'm looking back, right, at how we described our work and, and what we do, I think that there's a lot that echoes here. Um, so this diagram was created in, in 2019, 2020. Um, that describes sort of where we, why we exist. And so sort of stating that in St. Louis region, we need to take action to create the change that we want to see. And a lot of times the organizations are like just a few people using the infrastructure they have to, to, to do a big lift, right, in the community. So it's, you know, if you're a data person, you're producing analysis for a large organization who's making investment decisions, who's trying to figure out how to better support kids, whatever it will be. Um, and that's really meaningful, right? But like, as you can see, it's also unstable. There's a lot of pressure on those people. It could easily topple in one direction or another. And so what the Regional Data Alliance is trying to do is build infrastructure that connects people, um, uh, that sustains and supports infrastructure um, so that the action that everyone takes within their own organizations, within their own context, right, but based on their own community and constituency um, is, is stronger, uh, is, is more robust. Um, and I think that that's, that's still true. Um, and I think that that also, you know, responds to some of the things um, that we were just sort of talking about in that definition of data and how it's organized. And, you know, you can play with like, you replace people with this idea of deciding and infrastructure with knowledge and action with doing, but I, I think you get the point, right? Like, and, and we know, and it's gonna take a lot of us coming together over time 
You know, we know that everyone enters the space in a, in a meaningful way with good intentions. Um, and we want to make sure that folks who are doing this are more informed, more connected, and doing more equitable work in community. Um, but we also think there's more to develop, right? Um, and, and as the subtitle of this presentation suggested, uh, like how does data keep us accountable to community and coordinate across boundaries? Um, I'm going to spend the next little bit of time describing more of our work on the ground. Um, and, you know, really sort of like point to some things we're trying to think about. And I, I want to underscore before I begin, like, this is not comprehensive. Um, and even if it was, like, we wouldn't consider it complete, right? Like, these are some things that we're, we're trying, that we're thinking about, that we're trying to put together to respond to this question of, like, how can data be best equitably oriented within the St. Louis community? And what do we need to build from here? Okay. So the people components. Um, this is a, a photo from uh, the Data Science for Social Impact Summit um, at Washington University uh, with our great partners there at WashU Social Policy Institute. Um, uh, and I think we got why well, I think Jen Rose is on the call, like uh, like over 100 people right coming together to discuss data and how it shows up in community. Um, the little uh, uh, box at the top is also some feedback that we got, you know, through our RDA meetings. Yeah, word cloud asking how folks um, felt about the progress of the RDA. Um, I think this time folks discovered that you could submit emojis um, uh, through uh, the word cloud system. Um, but people, you know, how do we build communities of practice? How do we build community around um, data people connecting to each other, trusting each other, knowing what each other do? Um, is something that is so fundamental to how we do um, this work meaningfully across communities. But we also know it's not just about community building, although it, that's fantastic, right? It, it's how we turn community building and the folks who are around the table um, into something, into a, a notion of shared decision-making power, right? Like what sometimes we call governance, um, but, but I think that really what we're talking about is shared decision-making power. And, and these are some of the questions that we say should be around any relevant table discussing data governance, whether it's healthcare data. You know, we've also been working a little bit with the Institute for Public Health and Ann Trollard and Hillary Reno on like data infrastructure for, for STIs um, and, and what that needs to look like in a more community-oriented context um, and education data, social services, public services, right? So these questions around who benefits and who decides, um, like who benefits benefits from the data sharing we're trying to construct, who makes the decisions about how data flows from point A to point B, like those are essential questions um, when we talk about governance, right? And, and also really diving into like, what's the impact on individuals? What's the impact on providers? What's the impact on communities? And like, how can those folks inform, <laughs> you know, like inform like what those impacts are in, in a way that that is meaningful? Um, and, and going to the top, right? Like underscoring that like only well-governed systems can be equitable systems. Because if you don't have the right folks in the room with the right process to make these decisions, well, who's doing it on whose behalf, right? And, and how easy is it for a priority to change um, if people's preferences change or if the incentive structures change. So that's sort of like some of the things that we've done on the people component that we're going to continue to build upon. So the shifting to infrastructure, you know, this is a sort of long-standing project of ours uh, around organizing the current data that is out there, um, particularly published by local governments. Um, and yes, they're oftentimes quantitative or financial data sets um, that still need to be organized and accessible um, for the community to have information on their fingertips around like what's being built or developed? What is the city spending money on? Um, how are demographics changing over time? Um, I just want to underscore, those things are essential. Like what we're not talking about is getting rid of them. What we're talking about is like, how do we expand them? How do we expand how we use them in collaboration with community um, to be as, as responsive and equitable as we can? So this is sort of then the next step, right? So, so trying to organize and clarify what data is out there then leads to the ability to create deeper, higher quality, more accessible information. Um, so this is a, a, the work of the Vacancy Collaborative, the Vacancy Portal. Um, I want to highlight that like this is largely the lift of folks who are outside of the RDA, although we're connected to it in a lot of ways, like partners of ours, former staff members, current collaborators, we're all trying to learn. But the, the, the thing that I really dig about this um, is that there needed to be, I think it was um, 
12 data sets from four different departments coming together um, in order for you to know whether or not a parcel was vacant. Um, and that's a meaningful task of assembly that really helps someone who is just like, I want to know if this is vacant or not. I don't want to know if the forestry division labels it vacant or if the city owns it or if someone, you know, a, a private out of town person owns. I mean, those things are meaningful, but like, how do we make sure that people have access to the right information at the right time? I want to dive a little deeper too, though, right? So like that tells us that this, this property is vacant, but it doesn't tell us much about the impact. And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out now in partnership with Humans of St. Louis, um, also exploring this a little bit more with uh, Missouri Foundation for Health and a number of community partners, um, is that we know that the quantitative and spatial data can tell us what is happening, like this property is vacant. Um, maybe it can tell us like when it became vacant, um, but it doesn't really go deeply into why it's happening or like what the impacts of that vacant uh, property is on the community. Um, and so this is a, a story of uh, Sunday Whiteside uh, featured with Humans of St. Louis um, as part of the, the Community Builders Network. And what she's describing here is like the change in her community as uh, more properties have become vacant, right? Like we used to know each other, now we don't. Like there are a lot, of, there are a lot fewer people who are here. We feel a lot less safe. Um, and that has great implications on what we do and where we go. And, and just to bring in another quick anecdote, uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking to the, the new head of the Land Reutilization Authority. And the question he posed to me is like, I want to know what it feels like. Like how, how different does it feel to be in those communities today versus the 1970s? And it's like, okay, what information will we need to collect? It's a, I think it's a really meaningful question. But like, what information will we need to collect to know that? Because I think just like comparing, like, well, there was a building here in the 1970s, and now there's no longer a building here, that gets it somewhere, but it doesn't answer sort of deeper questions around how this fits together. And so this is sort of an early sketch of like, oh, could we center a story or center other components of qualitative data um, and sort of bring up or tag or align the additional spatial or quantitative data components um, that we feel like are really important, as well as like the relevant resources and reports. So instead of getting sort of like a, a, a static, like this is what the map looks like, you know, the one, the single number problem, um, you have a more expansive understanding of like, this is someone's experience in a place. Here are the other components of data that may connect to it. Um, there's a lot of work that would still need to be done to translate that into action, um, but trying to figure out like, again, like what is the infrastructure needed um, in order to put those pieces together? I also real quickly um, want to focus on some of the work we're doing in, in healthcare, um, in social care, under the banner of, of community information exchanges. Um, so this is something that's led in St. Louis by the United Way uh, in partnership with folks like us. The RDA serves as the data backbone. Uh, the Integrated Health Network serves as a healthcare backbone. There are dozens of steering committee members. There are like 200 organizations that are using this closed loop referral platform. But I'm going to zoom back to the data components, right? So, so one of the things we spend a lot of time on is unpacking the substantial differences between healthcare and social care data and social services, community services, community health workers, those sorts of things. And, and I think trying to unpack that like the data mismatch here is also a mismatch between models of care. And in order to understand and construct a more community-centered system, especially one that doesn't just like replicate like clinical care models, which I, I don't anticipate a lot of people are like super jazzed about, um, we need to, to look into like how our data systems organize in these spaces um, and how do we make sure that we don't like accidentally sleepwalk into a, a less equitable system. So in healthcare, patient goes to provider, clinic system cross, like these things are connected in like relatively um, modular ways between an individual EHR and a provider or clinic using some sort of standards to exchange information um, across systems through infrastructure called health community information exchanges, or now they're experimenting with health data utilities. It's like, is that just an expanded HIE? We'll, we'll see what happens. But in social services, it already is a lot more complicated, right? It's not just one person going to one provider at one center within an organized system with a common billing structure. But there's like 
families, right? That are being seen as like, well, we did a head start. It wasn't just like one person, one kid, one adult. Um, it was like, how can we support the family as a whole, right? Like, how do we intervene, you know, on behalf of a community where there are multiple different services and multiple different nodes? Um, a program may be attached to a provider, but it may not be. And there may not be an organized system. Like, so, so how does data kind of go between one and another? And, and just again, to complicate this even further, that's not what it actually looks like in social services, because what in social services it looks like is like a dozen of these things, all sort of disconnected. We're trying to figure out how to navigate the waters and really trying to hone in on like, well, what's different here and where do we need to go, right? When there's a diversity of funding sources, when we try to do person or community-centered care, so, so another thing that we're trying to think about of like data systems, how they interact with people, how we push past, you know, really trying to overly quantify or overly standardize um, people in care. <laughs> And so for like the, you know, seven of you who want to dive deeper into more of this stuff, um, we released a, a white paper a little bit over a year ago with the national organization called Open Referral to try to dig deeper into what we mean by a community information exchange, which is not a particularly well-defined term. What does it mean for what we call resource data? So like who provides what service where? What does it mean for, for client data? So it's like a person you know, identity matching, context, assessments, activities, consent, right? But but really underscoring this bottom component around community data governance, you'll see some of the same questions pop up, the impact on individuals, on service providers, on communities, um, and then what data infrastructure is needed uh, in order to construct an effective and equitable system. And so finally, too, right, like we're dipping our toe into the AI space. Um, this was a, a, a tool, like a very, a tool in, in, in demo <laughs> mode right now, uh, supported uh, with by, by the Federal Administration for Community Living, uh, developed in partnership with the Unity Foundation, a, a local developer, um, to try to help, again, like help humans be more human um, uh, in this process of data management. So, um, not going to go deep into this, but the idea is that we would be able to feed uh, either a, a, another taxonomy term or an assessment question or just like a block of text um, into um, more of a, a machine learning or natural language processing module um, that would help us determine like how to code something. You know, in the healthcare space, it's like ICD 10 Z codes, in the social care or social services space, this is the 211 taxonomy. But essentially what we're trying to do is like, well, how can we automate like recommendations for matching um, and then making sure that people still have the ability to say, this is more right than that. How, where do we go from here? Um, uh, and, and really trying to think deeply about like how we organize that information. Okay, so let's see if I can tie this all together. <laughs> we're gonna return real quickly to our definition of data with some of the work that we've been doing and want to be doing over, over the course of the next few years. Um, and, and here is sort of where we're landing and the things that we're really trying to explore um, in our pursuit of a more equitable and more complete data ecology. So when we're adapt, you know, talking about adaptable pieces of information, you know, we want to make sure that existing data is clean, organized, and accessible um, for everybody who, who may need to use it. Right. Um, and that, you know, needs to include more and more over time how qualitative data is available, how it's aligned, how people can use it. Uh, so we're not just sort of using and reusing uh, the same numbers or the same maps, um, but really diving deeper into like, what does this mean and what does this look like? Um, and then also this focus on interoperable infrastructure, what we just talked about in the health and social care space. Um, and, and trying to, you know, one of the things that we really like about interoperability um, and thinking again about like central planning and like the trying to control these sorts of things um, is that if done well, and I think there's a public component to this. So we all talk about like data utilities um, as a way to like make sure that everybody has access to similar information um, is that interoperable infrastructure can facilitate communication. Um, across different communities that then are able to set their own priorities, um, as opposed to like a central system that tries to control, right, like how things are delivered and organized. Um, and I think that that movement um, shows a lot of promise um, for this data work as a whole, uh, especially when we look at health and social care. <clears throat> 
when we talk about knowing, right, like, and how do we do this more in a community-based standpoint, um, we need to make sure that the community helps set the research or knowledge agenda uh, in partnership with technical experts. And like, you know, I, I, I'm one of them, I know a lot of uh, us around the table, I'm going to talk in a second about like the role of expertise in alignment with community, because um, I think that's an important needle to thread. But, but you know, what we know and what we want to know, it, it can't just come from like what is funded or what I am interested in, uh, but what we are hearing from a community that would be impacted um, by the by the knowledge, by the data, uh, by the analysis that we're doing. Um, the data are always localized and contextualized. Going back to that Head Start example, like does this work here is a different question than does this work nationally. Um, and we need the infrastructure and support in order to localize this information uh, as opposed to, you know, just assuming that like, oh, we can just like take and pick up this model in Baltimore and drop it in St. Louis and, and see what happens. Um, and that ultimately, right, that there are structures for us doing this stuff together, right, for shared learning, for translation back and forth, for feedback, for revision, that knowing should not be a static, I produced a piece of analysis, uh, here you go, um, but more of a conversation about like, what does this mean to you? Does this, does this reflect the experience of you and your neighbors? And we got to listen to that. And that, that also is a piece of information that should be um, incorporated into what we know about an issue. In terms of doing, right, that meaningful information is available for all who should be driving community action, not just policymakers, not just, you know, researchers, not just nonprofit executives, right, but like everybody, you know, who needs to be coming together to talk about um, where are we and where we need to go. Um, and I know that's a, that's a big question. That's a hard question, but I do think that the availability of meaningful information is a key starting point. Um, that resources can easily align with priorities and needs through clear but flexible categories. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in doing in the social services or social care space, um, but I think there is such a disconnect between like, oh, here is where people, there's a food desert, right, or people where people are food insecure, and like, here is where a food bank is, and like, does it have enough food to feed those people? Like, I, that's actually kind of an impossible question right now. Um, I think that it is, a, it is a tackleable one, even if it's like, you don't want these things to be overly codified, but you also want to be able to sort of compare things across time. Um, and that actions taken, right, are also incorporated into knowing. So knowing informs doing and doing informs knowing, um, and it's more of a cycle from there. And finally, this component of deciding, uh, which I said before, it goes to the top of our list, right, that when we talk about equity, um, we're really talking about those be, who are most impacted by an issue, having a meaningful ability to um, influence direction. Um, and that requires significant structural shifts in how we govern and manage social interventions and who gets to decide what we do, what we know, what data we collect. Um, those are very small rooms right now. And I think that we're not going to get to a better place unless those rooms become larger, although, you know, not just like a big room, uh, but a well-structured one that, that allows for aligning of community priorities with relevant expertise um, and relevant expertise being both technical and experiential. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on that last piece because, um, you know, room of experts, uh, people who are considered experts, people who have a lot of education and training um, around how these things fit together. Um, and, and one thing that I just sort of found so meaningful in thinking about how these things align uh, is what I'll call the shoe test. Um, this comes from John Dewey. He's a pragmatist philosopher, also in the early 20th century. Um, talks a lot about how we align interventions to public problems. Um, I dig Dewey. He had a great mustache. We are not going to talk too much more about him right now. Um, but, but a quote, the shoe test, that I think is a really good way to determine how expertise and community prioritization can align. So from public and his problems, killer uh, Dewey says that the person who wears the shoe knows best that it pinches and where it pinches, even if the expert shoemaker is the best judge of how the trouble is to be remedied. So, so I think that the shoe test for me is like, is this talking about it pinching, right? Like, and where it pinches, like, it's only the person who wears the shoe. It's only the person who lives in a community that knows how an issue is showing up for them. Um, and we discount that, 
right? Or we we think that we can, you know, we know it just because the numbers say that 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 we can know it um, in a way that sort of like diminishes their knowledge and participation of an issue. But that doesn't mean that when someone says like, hey, my, my shoe hurts, right? That they know exactly how to fix the shoe front to back. And you know, argument to be made that we should be making, you know, democratizing uh, uh, cobbler training, right? Like th that's fine. I think there's some good stuff to dive into there. But ultimately I think it's the balance of like, am I helping to remedy an issue that other people should define where we should spend our time? Um, uh, uh, or do I need to define what this problem looks like because it impacts me and my experience? And so I think the shoe test is meaningful here too um, in determining where and how expertise and community can come together. And so then sort of thinking about like, okay, are there other components of infrastructure that we need to, um, you know, do we need to develop? And so this is a very early sketch, like the 37 of you here um, are only the second folks to see this. Um, but what we're trying to figure out is like, how do these pieces fit together, right? Between the available quantitative data that we have, which again is super important, qualitative and contextual information we need to assemble and a healthy feedback loop between everybody who needs to come to the table and talk about like, where are we going? What's going on here? Where do we need to invest more resources? Um, and I think that that's, you know, again, like what, what Scott was talking about in terms of engaging in these vital questions together. Um, and so what infrastructure is kind of put under a, a frame of like participatory dashboarding, not really sure, like, could we build to align these things in a way where folks could interact more deeply um, and, and help to organize um, resources more effectively? And I'm on my last slide, right? And, and I, I, I think, right, so, so to, to tie it all together, that this is where I hope the Regional Data Alliance um, and all of us who hope to use data to pursue equity, to build a stronger community continuously, right? Wherever that may be, right? Um, and, and I think that like places matter a lot. Um, local context and history matters a lot. Um, I, I think that like this is really where I hope we're heading, right? Um, to optimally explore the use of data in society, I guess to, to underscore what the title of this presentation meant as a paraphrase of Hayek. Um, and this is really where, right, like I hope we go, right, to a place in which data can meaningfully inform the work that we do, that we do to know, to do, to decide, and, and recognize that each of these requires people coming together democratically to unpack priorities, trade-offs, and consequences. And it's a continuous cycle, right, and actually a continuous cycle in like both directions, but that looked kind of messy with the arrows. Um, but but that's really right, like what we're trying to do, right? To create systems that don't focus only on a single magic number, that if somehow we managed it and we focused on it hard enough, it would push all the other dominoes we need for change, right? It, instead, what we want to do is work to elevate and connect what we can count um, to what people experience, what what's hard to count, right? Like Like the other things that are so critical to understanding what's happening in a community, um, and where we can go together. Um, and, and I think that like for us, it's like, what is the infrastructure for what Dewey calls a planning society, right? This is also something in contrast to the failures of central planning, and Hayek and Dewey and I think Scott and everyone else, like we should, we should attack the idea that we can consolidate information within a point of power and expertise and then like wave our wands and have an equitable community um, that, you know, if we, we construct this planning society, you know, it would place meaningful information in the hands of people uh, who are impacted by the many challenges a society faces, and that who can hopefully now together, collectively and over time, move us toward a measurably more equitable and more whole community. And that's it. Um, I th we still have 15 minutes for discussion. Um, I am happy that you all are still here and um, am honored to speak to you today and would love to know a little bit more about what you're thinking about. Oh, fantastic, Paul. That was an extremely interesting talk. And I hope everyone else got, uh, got out of it as much as I did. Uh, I think, first of all, I'll just mention, if you've got a question for Paul, please raise your hand. Uh, you'll you'll pop up to the top of my queue here uh, in the screen, and I'll be able to call on you. Uh, if you don't feel like speaking um, 
live, you're certainly welcome to post any questions that you might have into the chat, and I'll uh, I'll moderate those for you. Um, to get us started, first of all, I, I think that was a great description of the impact and importance of data creation, sharing, collaborative effort, and um, I, I applaud you for that uh, for that broad ranging talk that was. Uh, as, as interesting as I hoped it would be. <laughs> and I hope everybody agrees on that. I think it's an excellent vision and discussion of the, you know, the major philosophical reasons why we would want to share data and the, the, the implications of, to our society of how that might work uh, if we are able to uh, successfully, you know, in, successfully bring that vision into into focus and and I think one of the things that you've done um, personally is you know with the beginning of the RDA I, I think you've kind of built that community around a um, a shared collaborative effort and, and I'd like you to talk just briefly about that that nuts and bolts process of kind of bringing that community together and with this kind of philosophy in mind, how, you know, how did you, how did you herd those cats and and get people to agree to share information that might normally be, um, you know, private or proprietary, and you know, to get beyond those kinds of boundaries. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great question, Bill, and I uh, again um, appreciate. Uh, Folks like you coming to the table at the beginning, and a number of folks who, uh, you know, sort of uh, who are on the call um, uh, are familiar faces too. Um, I think that from a nuts and bolts standpoint of like how we built the RDA's community, I, I think some of it was, um, I think you mentioned herding cats, and I, I think that it's like in some ways it's like we were all sort of stray cats in the data space here, where it's like, well, yeah, do we have shelter? Like where where is the milk? Like where do we go? And so I think that, that first of all we were responding to the need of folks for a forum to get together, um, in order to explore all of these issues um, uh, collectively in our community. Um, and we've never had trouble getting people to the table. Um, I, I do think there's some really good questions uh, that we're diving into now with the the data science for social impact team. So Genros, who's on the call, as well as uh, Sarah Muhammad from our team, who's on the call. It's sort of like, how do we structure and build that community um, more uh, durably and more responsibly over time? And so we're, we're talking about, right, like, what does a community of practice look like in which people have different tools or different forums to come together and connect the dots? Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say on that front is like, we know that all of that is essential, that trust building, that relationship building, that just sort of knowing like, oh, I can pick up the phone and call Bill at WashU if I have this question about the data they manage. You know, that really sets the stage for deeper data sharing, um, even though like, you know, at a certain point, the lawyers have to get involved. So I, I think that like at the end of the day, right, like we responded to a need in the community, um, uh, you know, built a table that did not already exist. Um, and I think the question really is now um, is what do we want to serve at that table? And who should, again, like who should be involved in the deciding um, of, of what's offered? I'm going to briefly pause in case someone wants to, uh, to interject here. I, I would bring, but encourage not, it. Bill and I, yeah. Bill and I can just talk, but it's more interesting yeah. for more folks than just the two of us chime in. <laughs> I, I certainly agree, but um, in order to keep the conversation moving along, one thought kept going through my mind during dur during this talk, and that was, you know, data is agnostic, and I think that's a I think that's a goal that we want to um, it, in order to foster a community of people that agree that this is important and are willing to accept each of these data points as being important. Mm -hmm. um, the, the data must be presented in a way that makes it, you know, acceptably agnostic. Yeah. Um, however, you know, we, 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 we live in a political world and um, how, how do you or do you, what are, what are your thoughts on the idea of data and it being agnostic? And, and how do you, you know, how do you build a, 
uh, a data sharing platform that will be easily accepted by all all members of the wide spectrum that we belong to. Yeah, I think it's a good it's a good question and it's a good point of tension. I um I don't know if I I would believe that data is agnostic or could be fully agnostic. I I do think that there is yeah I mean Jennifer like agnostic with context. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that it's important to sort of name like this is where it was collected and this is where the bias may may mm -hmm. show up. But I, I also think that data is unique. And that it's the components of information and like not the information or analysis itself. And because it's in component parts, I think it does have a greater ability um, to, to sort of like clearly state this is where it comes from, you know, like, you know, well, assessor data, right? Like the valued number placed on like a home's value, like that, that's not necessarily an unbiased number. But we can say this comes from the assessor's office mm -hmm. um, and here are the conditions in which it was collected. And that can allow someone who's using the information to use it, I think, effectively and responsibly um, without accidentally stepping into like, a, well, this is just what the data say, um, which I which I do think um, is really is really important. Um, and, and I think, Courtney, in the chat, you're making an essential point, right? Like what data we collect is not agnostic. And I just want to describe, like, I, I think more things should be, you know, small p political. What I mean by that is like mm -hmm. more things should be subject to community or public participation about like why we're doing these things or not doing these things. Um, but, right, I, I do think that like, by collecting metadata, by properly situating like where this data came from and what it contains and what it doesn't contain, I do think we can get a lot closer um, to a place in which people can apply those data to multiple different contexts um, and not like just carry in the assumptions um, from where it was collected uh, sort of unwittingly. Um, and Jennifer, I, I see you have your hand up. I just, to your point about, um, you talked about um, how um, the pain points are with the creators and the users of data and then the sort of data experts, uh, it's more our job to try to figure out those pain points, which I agree with. But I wanted wondered if you could talk a, a little more about different uh, user or creator types who ha will have different kinds of pain points mm. and the like real challenge. Like, And I think what the people who are data professionals are really working towards standardizing so that they can like get to like those different users pain points so like that maybe talk more about the tension between yeah. those things yeah no i'll give a i'll give a concrete example of uh this just sort of came up in a meeting yesterday so um there's an initiative in town called the st louis research practice collaborative uh, it's focused on education data in collaboration with researchers and school districts across the st louis region and i think that it's like it's a research practice collaborative so there's researchers and their practitioners um and the the data that the researchers need to to collect and there's doing a study right now on student mobility and sort of the factors that lead a student to move from school to school over time um are meaningful questions to, to practitioners like the practitioners were involved in saying like this is important to us but the infrastructure that's built the analysis that's done sort of like is it is it published in this format like do we need to translate it for practitioner use of saying like actually in this school you need to do this thing those things need to be negotiated and, and even within the practitioner world themselves like there's a difference between a school administrator and a teacher and there's also a difference between a school administrator a teacher and a student or a family that's being served and we can't just sort of assume that like the data that works for the researcher, which we can like get from the Department of Education, do some analysis around X, Y, and Z, it is the same information that a practitioner would find valuable, is the same information that responds to a parent priority. Um, so we're working through some of those things. I mean, I think that your, your point about standardization and one of the reasons why we spend so much time in that space is key, because if you can standardize things and ensure that like records can be shared from school to school, well, that also ensures that there's like clean information with attachable definitions that are available for a researcher who are trying to answer more of a longitudinal question about the, you know, the causes of mobility. 
Um, so hopefully that that answers your question. But I, I do think it's sort of like you can't ignore the differences between where where those folks are coming to the table. Um, but I do think there are some some methods that we can take um, that help account for multiple needs simultaneously. And then I think get us to that point. Like we really want to get to that point where we're just talking about priorities. We don't want to get to a point where we're like, well, we can only answer this question because that's all the data can tell us about. It's like, okay. I, you know, like that, that's, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> um, and that sort of like points, you know, our, our resources in one direction. Whereas I think that we all agree, it's like, no, this should be a, like, oh, this is an administrator priority, but not a teacher priority. Why should that come first? Maybe we end up, you know, focusing on a teacher concern the next time, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, and that your your statement about longitudinal studies, I think that that uh, brings up the issue that you know we can look back historically and and try and suss out what happened in the past. But I think when we look at what we're doing now and the activities of uh, an organization that's collecting and storing and you know disseminating data, uh, it's important to think about what's going to be information that's useful in the future, so that oh, yeah. instead of as we are now looking back and wishing we had information about, you know, various things, you know, hopefully we can build a infrastructure that will provide that sort of information into the future. And, and I would just circle back on this agnostic idea. I, I don't mean that to mean, I, I didn't uh, state that to mean that, you know, data has no um, underlying importance or, you know, and, it, and that it shouldn't. Uh, I just feel like if, um, if uh, a, a repository of information is going to be useful, it has to be trusted by all sides. You know, we have to yeah. have those facts that we all agree on. And yeah. I think that is kind of an important consideration. I, and I, yeah, let me let me just pick up on that real quick. I know we're almost out of time. That That is really where, right, like in talking about standards and in talking about like, you know, having shared infrastructure, it's really about like communication, right? And it, and I think data can be a, a key point of like, we're both looking at the same thing that I think we can all agree, like has a pretty solid definition. Um, and so instead of coming from like completely different, you know, realities or universes and just kind of negotiating the tensions from there, we have a common point uh, of departure and conversation um that can allow us to enter into this like uh, cycle of knowing doing and deciding in a more effective way so so i, I appreciate that bill because i do think that mm -hmm. data has a particularly uh powerful role to play uh in communicating across communities and communicate and and really allowing us to to focus in um on differences of values and priorities mm -hmm. yeah excellent and that's a great way to wrap it up paul First of all, thank you very much for, for bringing your insight and your experience uh, and to providing such a very interesting philosophical grounding for why data is important and why we would want to um, think about it in deeper terms than just here's here's a point on the map. So thank you. Thank you again for, for that, Paul. Uh, and for all of those who are still here, thank you very much for your attention uh, and for hanging around with us. Um, really appreciate it. And as I said at the start, there's other, other events coming up today and tomorrow. Feel free to join us then. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you all.